and welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I say this every time, and I mean it. It's a pleasure to come your way and talk to you and have the conversations that we have here on this program in regards to all of the things that are going on in the world, but not necessarily in this world. Sometimes it's in the other world, as we speak a lot of times, more metaphysically and spiritually. And uh, we may touch into that a little bit in terms of how this subject uh, impacts you and your personal life, because um, it maybe our guest will say that maybe it should, maybe it should in some fashion, because not good, not good. A lot of jokes are made by different people in regards to um, uh, children in our world, in our world. And we're going to talk with our very special guest here on the program. And uh, we're going to, uh, uh, I, I, I actually have to have this in front of my face in order to get it right. <laughs> Nijat Shal, Nijat Shah, And she is the producer, am I correct? The producer of the film, a uh, Gunjel? Yes, yeah, correct. And of course, in English, that is, uh, that is uh, of course, entangled. Well, we're going to talk about being entangled, yes. We're going to talk about um, uh, a lot of different aspects of this. As she is the producer, um, she's a humanitarian. She's also a TED Talk, a TEDx speaker as well. And uh, there's an upcoming, well, that's probably been released by now, but it's a, a social justice uh, narrative film. Uh, and um, as uh, and this is going to be an interesting conversation. June 12th is where uh, June 12th was, at least in this year, World Day Against Child Labor. And I actually use child labor laws as an example of why there are regulations here in the United States. Unfortunately, that hasn't translated into other countries in terms of treating children. Oh, I don't know. Like children and not like free labor or cheap labor. Um, first of all, what was the impetus for this film? Why did you personally feel that this subject needed to be dealt with? Thank you so much, Richard, for having me on your show. I'm a little nervous, but I will go ahead on. Let's see how I do. So um, this subject, um, I grew, I, I, you know, I grew up, uh, seeing children going to school or also helping their parents like with uh, like home chores so that was to be very dignifying job but later on when i moved to city for my higher education and i saw some uh, children working as domestic help and then uh, later on way later on i realized when i did my research that how child labor impacts so it kind of blew my mind that there are so many children they are still going to um not going to school but they are working each day and they are mm -hmm. earning money for their uh, families so and they are very much um having like having very bad treatment by their masters so that's how the inspiration for this movie came. I wanted to choose a subject that was more of a um, like a regional. Like so, I chose this guy's story. He is a child from Pakistan. In 1990s, he was sold to bonded labor by his parents. So um, he he worked as a uh, bonded child laborer for a couple of years. But he, this little child was very like strong, resilient. So he freed himself out of uh, the uh, masters and then he free, he joined an organization and helped free other people. And his name is Iqbal Masi. Mm. So this Iqbal. movie is his story. When I heard about him, I really wanted to, I, I felt kind of an obligation to tell his story. And I wanted to raise awareness about child labor. So his story came to mind because that's a best way to raise awareness about something because it's a um, 
a full story of resilience, of atrocities, and of inspiration and bringing change. And he did all of that. But unfortunately, he was murdered when he was very young, around 12 years old. So that kind of um, very sad, but his legacy lives on. We have schools under his name in Turkey, uh, in Italy, I'm sorry. In Italy, there are schools. And he, there's also an award that is called Iqbal Masi Human Rights Award. And it's given by the United States everywhere, every year. So that's why this story came about. The mm. film came about, the Gunjal. Gunjal is a, a film. It, is it available in theaters or just uh, on demand right now? Uh, Richard, this is not released yet. And not we yet. are, uh, yeah, not yet. So it's available nowhere. Some of the information that uh, was passed on to me uh, from uh, from you and your organization, um, according to the department, this is the United States now, because I think that's the only way this is going to make any sense. According mm -hmm. to the Department of Labor, the number of hazardous occupations violations, occupation violations regarding minors in the United States is increased by 94 percent. Um, another statistic here is that, and that was uh, 94%, and that was in 2015. In the U.S., typical violations include scheduling minors for work, uh, night work, working too many hours, or placing minors in harmful environments. Um, I want to share with you very fast, I'm, I'm not going to belabor this because I want your, your, uh, your story uh, to come out here. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, you said this was a very young uh, individual, I would say, no, he was not very young. He was a child. He was a child. I was, I was um, 12 years old when I first started working as a paper boy in Phoenix, Arizona. And the big difference between me and your subject, uh, the subject of your movie, is that it sounds to me like I had the choice to work. Yeah. He didn't. Agree totally. Um, a lot of people complain in the United States, especially um, during the 2016 campaign about regulations and people. And I, I would agree here in California, for example, regulations have run amok. They've just gone berserk. But the reason why regulations were instituted in the first place, and I'm assuming probably the earliest were maybe back in the 18, maybe early 1900s was child labor laws because companies, businesses, my, even mom and pop shops did not do the right thing. Is, uh, are there in other countries where we have, where you have, where you see this problem existing, uh, with underage, uh, I guess the best way to put it is forced labor. Uh, are there regulations that, that, oversee this and they these people just haven't been caught or are there no regulations in some of these countries and they just don't care they're going to whatever it takes to keep the economy going which seems to be the most important thing they're going to do it you know richard you just uh said very you just you brought a very good topic it's about it's not about like one place like pakistan or uh Bangladesh or Middle East or any place. It's about the whole world because children literally are the future of our this generation of the world, right? So if we do not take care of them, then we will have a bad world to live in. A mm. world where many people will be poor and uh, wealth will be just concentrated um, within like a couple of people. That's not looking good. So when you are saying, are there... Um, laws in these countries and i'm sure there are they always say we are to protect children we are to protect women we are to protect vulnerables but they're not implemented that's the problem and when this when this happens in united states like you said because we have very stricter laws in united states around child labor and labor in general and child labor in particular so kids should not do dangerous work and kids should not do work outside of their school hours they i mean within their school hours they can only do when they are not in school certain hours but what really breaks my heart is when i see united states some of the states in united states 
getting rid of those uh, protective laws or kind of uh, relaxing those laws to fit the need of uh, like maybe there are many immigrant children are coming in in the United States and uh, the economy is not doing as amazing. So the officials want to put those children to work. So right now, um, like our neighboring uh, state in Arkansas, I heard that uh, they have relaxed the laws where if a 13 year old child comes in and asks for a job and then um, that child, he or she says that, I'm 16 years old, you, sh you do not need to ask him or her. You can just give them the job, that's fine. And that's bad, that's like legalizing child labor. Mm -hmm. So when this happens in United States, it's more alarming and it's more upsetting and it's more dangerous because all the other countries, third world countries will get away with it and say, hey, we are poor. That's why a family of six or nine has no other option other than sending their kids to work. But what about United States? I mean, what about the developed countries where child labor laws are uh, being relaxed day by day? Mm. Your website, this is, this Adur, adurproductions.com, A-D-U-R? Yes, Adur Productions. All right. That's yeah. the website we're going to be linked to as we continue talking with our very special guest here on the program on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, I cannot thank you enough, um, Nagat Shah, for joining us here on the program and talking about the film. Uh, I'm guessing this is a documentary, correct? Or is this is this with actors and so forth? Uh, Richard, it's a, a narrative. It is a narrative, yeah. okay, it's a and it is called fictionalized biopic. Fictionalized biopic. It's narrative, and there are characters that are not. Some characters are not real character in there. Okay, so it so is we called. We have taken some uh, profession, like a uh, creative liberty in it. Okay, Gunjel, which is in translated entangled, if I remember correctly, yes. and uh, we. Uh, it's not released yet, but it soon will be, and I'm sure that going through the website, which is. Uh, adurproductions.com that's a-d-u-r productions.com as i said before we will be linked to that you uh you are uh um if i am uh, reading some of this information correctly you're an impact investor philanthropist producer humanitarian ted talk speaker uh, you you've got a lot of hats that you wear i only wear one <laughs> um yeah, literally but <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally for you and for me. Um, but uh, let me ask you about this aspect of um, uh, obviously humanitarianism. You're focusing with this film on children. Um, and I and I say this as an observer of the plight in the United States. Mm -hmm. You talk about how with the government and the laws, they say we are trying to protect the children. Their children are our future, which, by the way, I can't stand that phrase to put that kind of a burden on a child. Let the kid be a kid. Let them play. Let them have some fun until they're, I don't know, in their preteens or teenage years. Um, you know, let them enjoy, you know, because they, they bring joy to us when they do that. Anyway, Um but here in the United States, they say we care about our children, and especially when they uh, want to talk about, for example, uh, the 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 laws in terms of a woman's right to choose or not choose, and and they say we care about our children, and yet they do nothing about the mass shootings in various locations around the country, including the schools, the places of learning where kids should feel safe. The worst I had to deal with was other kids being bullies to me. That was the worst. And I learned how to run. I was very good in track and field, by the way. Um, are you are you getting more support from people who maybe used to think differently, maybe used to feel that, hey, you know, we've got to do what we need to do for the economy. And I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I know we need money to buy the food and the shelter and the clothing and the fuel for the vehicle and so forth. But from my, this is just my own personal belief. I don't know about yours. I'd love to hear about your beliefs on this. Um, 
in in our Bible, in the Christian belief, in the Christian philosophy, it talks about Jesus saying to the disciples, his followers who are worried about what they're going to eat and where they're going to sleep and what they're going to wear. He says, do you see that bird up in the tree? You see that bird up there? It doesn't work. It doesn't toil. And yet it's taken care of. And yet you are a child of the divine. How much more will you be taken care of? Uh, so the economy can go to heck in a handbasket from uh, on one level because we need to be trusting in that higher power, however you see that. What are your thoughts in that regard? Is is too much being made of this ec economic thing that has been created by man? Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm a Muslim. I'm a firm believer in what you said, actually. Um so uh, I totally believe uh, that even the um, what we are being told on TV, uh, what's happening to the economy, it's like they're creating the uh, fear. So some like for the benefit of certain people. So I always see that there is there's so much positivity, but usually we only hear the negativity because uh, negativity sells easily i guess so this is my belief tell me about your upbringing you said you are you are muslim uh wh in what country are you living these days i'm in the united states i live in tennessee really so I, yes <laughs> that's why i talked about uh, uh arkansas because arkansas is very near to us and like when I follow the rules and laws that are being changed, one of them that breaks my heart is when uh, child protection laws are being um, relaxed. It's it's sad. So I was born and raised in Pakistan. So I, I'm born and raised as a Muslim kid, Muslim woman. So that that's where was my upbringing. And I had a very nice, very kind childhood. My parents were one of the best parents, I could say. And I have also learned all these things that um, religion says that and Islam says, like you mentioned Christianity, that uh, God takes care of that one bird and how much more can God do for you, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, God does so much for us. Like it, he, he gives us unlimited, honestly. So the same thing, like if you like you also talked about the gun laws and all those, right? Mm -hmm. So Islam, Islam says that if you save one one life, that means you save the humanity. So I don't know where you stand, what's your belief, but gun laws should be tighter, strict. So not everybody has access to law these guns so yeah. these shootings are going on every day we hear about this shooting and that shooting and it's funny when um i was in europe recently on a tour so we were touring switzerland and our tour guide was a swiss woman and she was telling us this was a big debate that how in united states how scary it is in united states of of, of gun violence and we're like no, we we are okay because we live. I live in Memphis, and we feel safe. And they were telling us that in Switzerland, people are kings and queens of referendum. They do referendum for everything that they want to change. They want to bring uh, new laws and stuff. So they banned gun guns through referendum because they thought they were having so many gun violence. And so many gun violence for them was only one death, gun-related death. That blew my mind. I'm like, that can happen in some part of the world, but it won't happen in the United States. No, unfortunately. And of course, uh, our Second Amendment does not define what is arms, you know, uh, the right to bear arms or weapons or guns. What have. It doesn't specify what yeah. arms you can bear, what the, what you can have. Uh, and I, I take it to the most illogical, ludicrous uh, end of the spectrum and say, all right, I want a nuclear bomb. It's my right to bear arms. So if I want a nuclear bomb, I should be able to have a nuclear bomb. 
or a flamethrower or any of the other absolutely ridiculous killing devices that we have. What does a person in the United States need for an AK anything? Now, yeah. some will say, well, we've got to be armed uh, and ready just in case the government decides to come in and uh, take away our rights. I, as a spiritual person, as a metaphysician, I was born and raised Catholic, and um, I don't want to say necessarily that I outgrew it per se, but it's something that I moved on from. But I love, I was a Baha'i for a year and a half, and I love the one saying that it's kind of along the lines of what you said earlier. If you accept one of the messengers of God, you accept them all. If you reject one of the messengers of God, you reject them all. And I loved that. It was so beautiful. Uh, and I am trying to learn from all of them. I have a good uh, a friend who is a rabbi. I'm trying to learn about the Jewish faith. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn from people such as yourself about, um, mm -hmm. and I'm never sure how to pro how to to say it, whether I'm trying to learn about the Islamic faith or the Muslim faith. I'm not sure which is correct or if they're both correct. They're synonym synonyms. Yeah, yeah. Learn. Islamic faith is also Mus Muslim faith. Yeah. Okay, so Islam I, is that like when you say Christianity, it's similar to saying like Islam, okay. Christianity and Islam and Judaism. Faith. By the way, I was interviewing a gentleman back in the 80s, uh, all the way back there. Uh, he was an or he was with uh, an organization called CAMP camp, and it stood for Christians and Muslims for peace. Oh. And he said in the interview that Christians and Muslims have more in common than do Christians and Jews, which I thought was really interesting, probably offended a lot of people too bad um, <laughs> because we have been sharing misinformation about our history for uh, probably centuries. You think about Christopher Columbus. I'm sure you've heard the story of Christopher Columbus discovering America, but yeah. he didn't. Leif Erikson <laughs> did. Leif Erikson discovered I've America. And I'm still trying to figure out why it's called America when they, you know, for some reason they gave America Vespucci, I guess he was an Italian. Uh, he gave him that honor and named this country America. So anyway, that's kind of uh, a side point. Let me ask you about, uh, before we move on here, uh, about when, you, when will this film be released for those who are listening? I know you mentioned it earlier, but I'd like to have you say, uh, tell us again. And where will they be able to see it? What if there's any cost, and how can they learn more? And for that matter, how can they get involved in, if I'm correct, this cause of getting these 200 million children around the world released from these forced labor situations to just be children? Yeah. So uh, first about this film. Um... We are planning to release it end of this year after it has the festival run completed. After that, we will release it. We will have limited release in different uh, regions of the world. So first, uh, probably we'll release it in Pakistan because uh, the story is coming from Pakistan and we have some uh, A-list actors and actresses from Pakistan. So we'll release it there. We'll release it like in uh, cities, like in one or two theaters in different cities. So it's not going to have a massive release, of course, because it's an indie film. And I still, we still need to find like distributors who are willing to distribute in their cities or in their regions. And your second question, and how can people be involved in saving children? Well, there are many ways. And I found one of the way to be amazing is telling the stories of social justice uh, violations and raising awareness. My way of being involved is through film and through narratives that how can we fix certain things that are not right. And I also give like try to give to uh, foundations who are working. And I found out there uh, there's one uh, one person who is Indian, uh, Kailash Satyarthi. He received Nobel Peace Prize in 2014 with, uh, he, he shared the prize with Malala. So he has organization um, to um, save children from slavery, basically forced labor or bonded labor. 
So you can give to his organization and there's Nelson Mandela organization. You can, you can give or um, to their organization and also volunteer. So there are many ways. And one more important thing, like as consumers, we consume a lot. We have to be, I, I, I will give you an example. Recently, we were in uh, Italy and we went to buy uh, some, some artifacts, some, uh, and also some carpet for our home. And my daughter came there and said, mommy, before buying anything, you should make sure where are they made and who made them? Because this is what, this is, this is who you are all about, right? This mm -hmm. is you are about that you take care who is making what and whether you should consume it or not. Because we as consumers in the United States give like a power to uh, these people who are employing child labors. Mm. So that's the best time. you can do. And yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, I have a hard time buying even from China, not because I have a problem with China. I have a problem with their yeah. products. They're garbage. And we get reports every so often that, oh, the kids' toys that they're buying at Christmas made in China, oh, the paint's got lead in it. Uh, so those can't, we can't buy those. And 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 I still remember this crazy story, had to have been 20, 30 years ago, uh, a, a supplement called L-tryptophan uh, that was imported Apparently, mm -hmm. a total of 400 people in the United States out of 350 million had some mm -hmm. adverse re reaction to it. I don't know if they died or not. I hope not. The product was actually banned in the United States because 400 people, 400 people. Now, one is too many, certainly. To, to I, I mean, I just have d been dealing with my wife's uh, uh, illness here recently, and I don't even want her to be ill, and I don't want it either. <laughs> but it's it, it does seem to be kind of crazy that people are willing to uh, buy, because I, I, again, I don't know where these things are manufactured, but mm -hmm. when your daughter brought up the issue of the rug, did it become difficult for you to find manufacturers in the world, whether it was here in the United States or elsewhere, who weren't using child labor. Uh, because it, it seems like it's permeating our uh, production lines, as you've talked about, around the world. Around the, yeah, it is very difficult to actually know who is making what and where are they making it and how they are paying their employees. It's difficult. And mm -hmm. there are some companies, I don't have them off of my hand, but I can send you a list. They do the research and put some good companies up on their website. Okay, good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I know that you've got some solutions. We want to talk about those solutions as well. As we continue here on Tell Me Your Story to talk with our very special guest, Nagat Shah about the film that will be released soon after it makes the uh, the festival circuit, uh, Gunjel, uh, which is translated, uh, as you said, from Pakistani, if that's the right language. Uh, Entangled is the title. The website, by the way, for you to find out more and probably find that list. It would be good to have that list as well. Adurproductions.com. Adur, A D U R Productions.com. And this is Tell Me Your Story. Whoop. Hold on one moment. I just punched a button I shouldn't have. And here we go. And we're back with Tell Me Your Story as we're talking with our very special guest here on the program. Uh, her name is uh, Nagat Shah. And the, the film that she has produced, and I'm curious as to how long it took you to to uh, get this film made. When when did when did the idea of the film start, uh, and and uh, how long did it take to make? And it sounds like you made it in uh, primarily Pakistan. Um, it was um, the production happened in Pakistan, but everything else happened some in India and some here in the United States like editing post-production was mostly done in United States and in India and some in Pakistan. The filming was done in Pakistan. So the idea of this film came to uh, like, 
uh, in two th- actually, Richard, I wanted to tell this that I'm not a filmmaker or a film person per se. Mm-hmm. I am just a humanitarian. So I wanted to raise awareness first, initially in 2020, about mental health and suicide prevention. So that time, I wanted to uh, make a 10 minute short film about mental health, but then we end up making a 30 minute a narrative. So that when to so many places and won award uh, from festivals and all that. So that gave me an encouragement that if a little film can bring so much change, maybe I should think about child labor because child labor has always was always on my mind that I would do something about child labor because I can as a mom, I cannot see children like doing domestic work or too much work. Like chores are fine but too much work and child labor is so sad. So this idea came to us um, in the beginning of 2001, 2001, that we should make a film about this child, Iqbal Masi. So it took us six months to do research, to meet the people. And uh, we also found out about the teacher who had hosted this child in uh, Massachusetts. So we talked to that teacher and he gave us a two hour long um, Ron Adams, teacher name is Ron Adams. So he gave us the two hours long video of Iqbal Masi visiting his school when uh, uh, his his seventh grader students. Hmm. So that really helped us in shaping like our story uh, around like uh, what kind of a dynamic little child he was. I love the bells in the background. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's my my clock. <laughs> uh, not a problem at all. Um, I like going here for the moment because I want to ask you, as we've talked a little bit about your faith, your your the philosophy that you that you follow, uh, mm-hmm. the meaning of your name, Nagat Shah. If I'm pronouncing it correctly, I hope I am because I want to show you respect. The very few people who. Who are pronouncing my name just the way it is. I'm, I'm glad. so happy. <laughs> what does it mean? What does Nagat Shah mean? Well, uh, my this Nagat means fragrance. Fragrance. It's a Persian name. Mm-hmm. And Shah is king. And my middle name is Akbar. That's mean great. So Wonderful. You've also produced another short film called This Bank of the River, which uh, bar- apparently has received some uh, very critical acclaim, a wonderful uh, a critical acclaim for its stark portrayals of, as you were talking earlier about the subject you were initially starting out on, suicide and mental health, which is uh, the next the next big pandemic that we are now dealing with, though it's not being called a pandemic, but at least now we're having the conversations. Are you happy about that aspect of it? Um, really, what happened is when, um, you know, uh, I'm from a very small mountainous region in Pakistan. And in my town, for the past 10 to 15 years, we have been hearing so many youngsters committing suicide. But anytime there's a small news, I never saw a big news about like somebody committed suicide because, okay, when someone, one person commits suicide, it's not a big deal uh, for the whole community or for, for whole country. But if in one region or in certain regions, there are many children, many youngsters, youth committing suicide, that's an alarming thing. So I never saw in the um, like, mainstream media of Pakistan uh, talking about mental health and suicide problems and what's going on in these regions. That's why I said, I need to do something. I need to raise awareness and give give a kind of um, narrative to these people to talk about in the mainstream media. And I am so happy to say that film, if you see it on YouTube, that doesn't have that many views because I never released it initially. Mm -hmm. I only took that film to special places and we screened it to the um, Human Rights Standing Committee of Senate in Pakistan. So we screened it to the um, like uh, policymakers Mm -hmm. and we screened it to universities. We screened it in colleges, in uh, schools. 
and we screened it to the uh, Pakistan uh, Mental Health Coalition. So that kind of really helped. Now I see so many programs around mental health and suicide. It's no more a taboo subject and I'm happy to help a little bit in that. Mm. And now one of the big universities in Pakistan and hospital, Aga Khan University has started a, um, I started this, um, sorry, can I, can I rephrase it? Well, um, uh, it's 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 just interesting how uh, all of this stuff is unfolding. I'm going to uh, actually move on from that because something you mentioned earlier really struck me and I wanted to touch on this because uh, I think it's very important. Um, yes. You you touched upon it earlier and I'm going to read this here. Several high profile investigations involving child labor have been in, exposed over the past year including the use of child labor in Hyundai and Kia supply chains, where? Not in Pakistan, not in China, in Alabama, as JBS meatpacking plants in Nebraska and Minnesota, and as fast food chains and at fast food chains, including some of your favorites, not mine, I don't go there anymore, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, and Chipotle. And the reason is because uh, include that they include excessive or extreme poverty, war, regional economic instability, and natural disasters. Now, I can ex- I can accept the whole natural disasters thing, uh, but the the other four, or actually that's three. The other three, they don't have to exist. And yet, it has been said, and I don't know if you've uh, looked into this at all or not. It has been said that there is more than enough food on this planet to feed everyone over, even though there are over 8 billion, uh, multiple times. There's more than enough food. That's not the problem. It's the distribution, which unfortunately, it sounds to me like it's being um, manipulated by the powers that be, the various governmental bodies and so forth, the the corporations and so forth. Oh no, we're not going to be sending money, uh, food to uh, this impoverished place. They won't. They won't. They won't even know what to do with it. It's food. You eat it, you knuckleheads. It just seems to me that that uh, I'm curious. Uh, let me, and I'm going to back this question up. Have you noticed since you've been on this? This uh, this campaign, if you will, uh, this this crusade, this humanitarian crusade, have you noticed changes for the positive, for the good in some of these countries that you have been talking about or talking and speaking in uh, that have started to say, you know what, we've really been doing a deplorable job. We we need to do better, and they're starting to do better, or is it just getting worse and worse around the world? No, I think uh, there are countries that are doing very positive thing. And during our visit, like uh, uh, we, I attended Cannes with my family and my friend um, this recently, uh, last uh, May. So we happened to see what France is doing. And also in Switzerland, I was very inspired what was happening in Switzerland. And they don't do so much wastage. And they somehow they reshare or redistribute what is um, what is left over. And also when uh, we were in Italy, they were also telling us that some of the restaurants, they do not throw their um, whatever is left over after cooking or something. And they, they give to poor people. And um, I think in one of the countries, I forgot the name yesterday, it just I, I saw an article that uh, even the fresh produce will be redistributed to um, shelter homes and yeah. also to um, other places like uh, foster homes and places where people would, would use them. So uh, places are improving in those things. I think some places in United States, people are doing it, mm-hmm. but not as a, a national strategy. If you do it, it's way better. It's Like you said, there is so much food for more than billion people in the world. It's just the greed of that certain um, corporations Mm -hmm. that is letting this uneven or un um, what do you say unfair distribution of wealth. Yeah, 
and I'm not advocating the redistribution of wealth per se. However, uh, it does seem to me that there there is a way for people in that percentile, if you will, that high bracket, uh, mm. to do a little bit more. I mean, how many cars and boats and planes and whatever do you really need? And I'm, you know, and it's like, okay, so you say you want a thousand. All right, well, that's what you want. I got that. Okay. But have you ever thought you're not alone on this planet? You've got some solutions here, better economic support for families, increased focus on children's education, universal ben child benefits, uh, and also uh, keeping up to date with the information, the information which is available online uh, in reports published by the UN, UNICEF, and the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, we also ask you folks to uh, be an informed consumer. Tell your Congress, congressional representatives uh, who aren't involved in uh, vendettas, if you can find one, uh, to support child protection laws. And you can go to ILO.org. I'm going to give these out. We won't necessarily link them. I'll see what I can do to put them up with the YouTube video. UN.org and DOL, Department of Labor.gov, that is, Department of Labor.gov. We are talking with our very special guest here. She is actually uh, the producer of uh, Gunjel. Her name is uh, Nagat Shah, and you are listening. Uh, you are listening to tell me your story. I got uh, started here with this program <clears throat> about 40 minutes ago with our very special guest, Nagat Shah, and we're talking about Gunjel. It's the movie, the translation is Entangled, uh, about, uh, again, a Pakistani a young man, correct? Who. Yeah sadly was was martyred because he was trying to make things better at the age of 12 the same age i started delivering newspapers in the united states back in 1972 uh and um obviously there is hope because you're involved in this you are trying to help people uh, are you seeing the 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 ranks grow through your website or some other um some other logistics or analytics, if you will, um, that are saying, we're going to join you. We're going to do everything we can to to make changes in our country or in our community. If it's the United States, and I don't know about other countries, uh, but in their particular state or province uh, or town or city or hamlet, what have you, are, are you seeing uh, more and more people jumping on this and saying, look, we've if if this civilization overall is going to have a future, we've got to do something now. Yes, uh, people I have spoken to so far, they're so enthusiastic about the cause, about raising awareness, about helping in whatsoever. Recently, I spoke to one of the uh, award recipients of um, Iqbal Masi Human Rights Award, and she said she is fully on board. Uh, Lalita is her name. So she's from India. So yes, there are people who are uh, trying to help and who are um, want to who wanting to raise awareness about child labor and the issue and about the film. Here, one thing that I want to just uh, mention that the story is from 1990s Pakistan. So oh, this wow. child was murdered in 1994. So. After that, you would ask me, have the laws been better? Is there child labor or not? You just saw that we found out there is child labor in the United States. So no. So there are domestic children, the children who are in domestic child labor, children who are in bonded labor. So it's increasing. It's mm -hmm. increasing more now than in 2015. That's what my computer tells me. Internet tells me. Wow. It just seems absolutely bizarre. It really it is. does. It is bizarre. Yeah. So children, school children needs to be in school, need to study, need to read, but they don't because they can't. That's why they are working and they're sold or they're forced. Mm. Is, is, I'm curious, is any of this, does any of this have to do with this this other area that is still tied into this because it's dealing with the children, uh, these uh, sex trafficking 
uh, organizations and groups around the world. Is this uh, also part of this, or is that something that is separate only because of the subject matter, not separate because this is dealing with children as well as adults, but we're yeah. focusing here on children today. Yeah, yeah, that that's tie-in, but like you said, it's not different because it's not different because it's also children, but it's mm -hmm. different because those children are used for something else. These children are used for making things. And I'm not saying that children who are bonded labor are not being taken advantage in that sense. Mm -hmm. So you never know. Uh, children go through a lot, a lot of atrocities, and uh, they've been beaten up. They've been abused in multiple different ways. Mm. That list you referred to earlier of manufacturers who are doing the right thing. They're not using uh, children, I would guess, what, under the age of 16 or 18? Is there a, a, from your perspective, covering all of this for the number of years you have, is there a, an appropriate age at which, yes, this young person can go ahead and go to work, but it has to be their choice. We're also talking here about forced labor as well. That's that's also the aspect of it. Yeah. What kind of work these kids can do? That's very important. Like my, my daughter started working in Subway sandwich shop when she turned 14 years old. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And she, she would work there after school. So she was making sandwiches, like cold sandwiches, not like she wasn't handling the fryer or anything. Mm -hmm. She was 14 years old. That's that's fine. But how about these children 10 years old uh, cooking? I mean, handling the fryer in McDonald's. A few days ago, we found out that what 10 years old was uh, burned because uh, she or he was handling the, uh, the fryer in McDonald's. Mm. Those are dangerous work for children, but not for adults. So we yeah. have to see children like 16 years old can go to work and probably can handle the fryer, I would say, and not younger than that. Yeah. So it, and then it's, when they are adults, they can choose work for themselves, whether it's dangerous or non-dangerous. So it really depends upon the work that they're going to be doing that they choose as to whether or not they're old enough to do that work. Yeah. And also education is important so school age children should not be working when it's time to go to school yeah yeah they need the they need the education which is a whole nother subject as well here in the united states especially because many of the schools are not even teaching the fundamentals and um, uh, the kids are coming out of grade school, going into high school. They probably still can't read. They go through high school and they probably still can't read and do basic math. Um, I used to argue that that college is not the place for the remedial courses. If you don't know how to read and do basic math and English and so on and so forth, I'm not going to sit here and belittle you and say, what the heck is your problem? I'm saying, let's get you to the level so that if you want to go to college, if you want Let's get you to that level so that you can jump in with both feet going after whatever vocation or career you want to go after. But here in the United States, a lot of kids, they just don't have it. And then there are situations where some kids, college just isn't isn't their thing. I, I only went to uh, three semesters of junior college and then a vocational school in 1981 and that's all of the formal education beyond high school that I had. And yes. here I am today talking with you <laughs> here on the program. That's, that's amazing. But the thing is, yes, like you said, uh, schools need to teach basic skills and basic like reading and writing. And college should not be for uh, going there and now starting to read and write. Yeah. So yeah. college should be, as it says, higher education. And I know I, I witnessed that uh, because uh, I was in when I was doing my master's, my my undergrad, uh, actually my undergrad. So I had a volunteer program. I used to go to Memphis City schools to teach children. So I I came from Pakistan. English for me is a second language. Mm -hmm. So but I I took I took on to teach math because I'm pretty good with math. When I went to Memphis City Schools and I said, you know, I can I don't want to teach like very young kids because they're hard. You are just teaching them plus minuses and that. I said I would I could handle algebra and uh, the higher level math. So I would 
teach seventh graders. So to my surprise, when I had three or four students who wanted to learn math or English, they said, they didn't even know how to read. I was teaching them how to read in seventh grade. So I asked so many people, why is this like this? I mean, how, how are they in seventh grade if they do not know how to read the third grade book? And they said, it's the program that started here during the Bush era, No Child Left Behind. So No Child Left Behind, they are on a grade level based on their age, but they can't read. I think, uh, yeah, it's, um, I was going to say something. I'm going to hold that in my head. Um I want to uh, tell you folks that this is an important issue. If you really do believe, if you do believe that our children are our future, then you need to do something. Uh, I am doing something by talking here with Nigat Shah about the film uh, Jun, uh, 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 Gunjel. And I hope that you folks will uh, watch the film when it does come out. You can go to uh, Ad, uh, Adur. Productions, A-D-U-R Productions.com will be linked to that website so you can see her film. I think it would be very important for all of us to at least watch the movie and and uh, uh, get the impact from what she is talking about here on this program, which, by the way, this program is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And um, Nagat, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story, I, I am always intrigued by a person's, uh, the philosophy that they have adopted as they've grown and, um, and, and, and reached maturity and so forth. Um, young people really, uh, children really don't, they don't have any points of reference. Whatever they're told is what they believe rather than what they believe is what they choose and that's why I do believe in a very wide and diverse education in the various philosophies of the globe. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things that I find so fascinating is people just don't want to. They don't want to learn about uh, if they're uh, if they're a Christian. I don't want to learn about the Muslim faith. I don't want to learn about the Jewish faith. I don't want to learn about Hinduism uh, or Sikhism or whatever ism you want to put on the table. And it's like, man, I want to learn about all of those so that I can understand where a person's coming from. I I really offended a woman that I was talking with on the phone back in the 80s. At the, I was working for a Christian station, by the way, yeah, back then. I didn't know what her philosophy was. And I made a comment uh, about Adam and Eve. And she took great offense. Well, what was interesting was as soon as she took great offense, I knew exactly where she was coming from. And I apologized. Because I had lived next door as a kid growing up to a family of nine of that very philosophy. Yeah. And I knew a lot about the Mormon faith or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also learned, too, that the Catholics were considered the church, what's considered the Whore of Babylon, but that's another story for another show. But it seems to me that that we've lost our desire almost to connect with one another one another on any level you think that that's also part of the problem that we've got in this world oh i always say that i mean we have lost the connection to humanity the kindness love for each other and taking care of each other that has that has gone away i mean we need to bring it back somehow the humanity like when you see some somebody hurting someone you want to go and help you need to have that in you again it's mm. not like you cannot be just a, a quiet a spectator and let the people do whatever they do you go there and help help mediate and help solve the problem so um these are some of the very important things yeah. and thank you so much for having me uh, richard on your show it has been a great conversation and I hope I um, was okay with you, all the things that I said. You have been absolutely fantastic. I, I do have three final questions that I like to ask all of my guests. Uh, sure. And I will ask those of you as soon as I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story. 
new paradigms for a new world where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. And we are also on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. with our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. We stream those programs live at richarddugan.com and we podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. We're also, as I mentioned before, on YouTube, where you can watch these interviews. And I also hope that you will go to our guest's website and find out more about the work that they are doing. We um, also ask you to click notification so that when a new conversation is posted, you'll know about it and you can go and listen and learn more about what's going on, what's really going on in the world. I'm not saying that I'm uh, the, the, the arbiter or the oracle of news and information that's correct and accurate. I am a, a person who is just trying to allow others to share their perspective of the way they see the world and how they're trying to make it a better place for everyone. We also ask that if you can support the work that we are doing, we would greatly appreciate that. We have a PayPal account. It's there for your security as well as, well as ours. When you go there and uh, they'll ask you, who, to whom do you wish to send? Then just put in my email address, which is richard at richarddugan.com. That's richard at richarddugan.com. We also ask that you spend time during this decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, going into that quiet, peaceful, calm, still place and listening to that still, small voice. Let it guide you. It's never guided me wrong. And it's a heck of a lot better than the GPS on my phone, let me tell you. <laughs> so with all of that being said, we now move to uh, the final three questions of our program here on Tell Me Your Story. And the first of those questions is, who is Nagat Shah? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to. I, I wanted uh, in my mind. I was thinking that I hope I will not be asked this question. <laughs> but here sorry you about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so happy when you didn't ask it in the beginning. So, Nagat Shah is a mother of two children, and I am also a businesswoman. I started a business with my husband. We both started like two decades ago, real estate and development. And now I'm a filmmaker as well. So um, I am driven by my, um, by heart, my heart kind of, I'm a humanitarian, most importantly. What is your life's purpose? Wow, my life purpose is to do good, like just be kind to people. And also, I feel like I have come to this world to connect people instead of uh, breaking people apart. So I see my purpose as I, uh, like a, a person who connects others like stories or uh, people. Yeah. And finally, what was your best day? Every day. I, I'm a very positive person. So I don't take like um, grudges, keep grudges about days or years. So I stay happy, honestly. So I'm a very happy person. So every day is a happy day. Mm. Well, again, I thank you so much for being with us, for sharing your story, the story of uh, uh, Gunjel. And uh, we certainly hope, uh, by the way, do you think that you will be coming through Santa Barbara for our Santa Barbara Film Festival in January? Yeah, I'm planning on that. And well, will you be there? I live in Santa Barbara and I hope to see you here. Yeah, definitely. I'll keep up. Please. And, uh, I'll send you an email. Yes. Absolutely. I would love to meet you in person. And I thank yes. you so much for being with us. This has just been uh, very eye opening, even for me. And because I, I probably still live a somewhat of a sheltered life and need to be educated about some things. We all do. We all live a sheltered life. We just have to um, go outside the box. And literally what you said, we have to learn. Yeah. Once again, my guest is uh, Nagat Shah, the film is uh, Gonjel, 
And we certainly look forward to seeing that, especially when it comes here to Santa Barbara uh, in the uh, in the winter of uh, 2024. Uh, but until then, I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, where we are giving you new paradigms for a new world, choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol. And Jeanette, I'm listening. Dad, continue to be happy. And my friend, Doug, I miss you, friend. <laughs>